Amen. As we're saying there, you know, the Bible says that there'll be no liars go to heaven. We get, sometimes people misconstrue that verse because I believe every one of us, even if we're saved, you've told a white lie since you've been born again. Amen. And if you ain't, if you ain't never done anything wrong since you got saved, well, bless you. But I know there ain't nobody here got that mentality because all of us have failed. But you know, when the Bible talks about there'll be no sin enter into the kingdom of heaven, that means it's talking about that glorified body. When I come up out of the grave, or uh, if a rapture were to take place and there's a drastic change that takes place and my, my flesh will no longer be marred by Adam's fall, and I'll be unable to sin, Brother Bill, I'll be like him. And Christ never was able to sin. He never was. If he could have sinned, he could still. He might be able to still sin. But I'm glad when Christ was in the world, they, they, they was there was no idemic nature about him. He couldn't sin. He was tempted like, and always like as we are, yet without sin. He never failed. And so when we get over yonder, we won't be able to fail. And uh, but anyways, that's not the message. I'm just glad to be saved this morning. I ain't never got over being saved. And so, if you're in Joshua chapter 15, say amen. And we normally don't do this, but, uh, you know, we, Brother Bill, I thought, I thought about you this past week. And uh, I, I don't, uh, I know that sometimes, you know, we, we live in, I'm going to say it pretty plain. We live in a day where there's a lot of people wanting to kneel when the national anthem is played. Can I go ahead and state where I stand on that? I'm against it. Amen. As old timers would say, I'm against it. Amen. Uh, I believe that we ought to reverence the flag of the United States. And anybody that's making over a million dollars a year ain't suffering persecution. Amen. Doesn't matter what walk of life they come from. And, and uh, I believe these athletes... Uh, that's making millions of dollars out to stand. I believe it's a, it's a reverential thing, and uh, I, I'm I'm for that. But I got to think, Brother Bill, that this Bible that we have in our in our possession today, it's the Word of God. I believe this to be the the Word of God, and so in moving forward as a church, and I had. I had somebody come to me here not long ago and they, is, they inquired about this. And I said, well, I'm not against it. Not necessarily, I don't advocate it. But the longer I've thought about it, the more I believe we ought to advocate. You say, what are you talking about? Well, we're going to stand to reverence the reading of God's Word. And it ain't, re you're not reverencing me. I'm, and, and let me go ahead and state where I stand on this. I, this may just be a morning of me just, you know, rambling but uh, I, I'm not a reverend there's only one reverend amen. amen I'm a preacher and I'm a pastor but if they's ever been a reverend the only person that's due reverence is him amen so we're going to stand this morning and we're going to start every time that the holy word of God is open we're going to begin we're going to start by standing and uh, you're not reverencing me or any other preacher that will fill this pulpit. But uh, we're going to reverence the reading of God's word. And after we read, you can be seated. But Joshua chapter number 15, verse number 16. Interesting thought this morning, and I pray that God will help me with this. I was up late last night, and I've not studied on this very long, but I could not get away from this thought, and I hope that it'll help our church this morning. That's who I'm preaching to. I'm preaching to everybody, but I believe it ought to motivate the church. And so Joshua chapter number 15, look with me down at verse number 16. And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kerjeth Sefer, and taketh it to him will I give Aksa, now, y'all just have to help me out with that word there, Axa, to wife, my daughter to wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it, and he gave him Axa, his daughter, to wife. And it came to pass 
as she came unto him, that she moved him to ask of her father a field. She's talking to her husband, and she's wanting him to go talk to her father about a field. And she lighted off her ass, and Caleb said unto her, What wouldest thou? Who answered, Give me a blessing. Now I want you to notice what she says next. For thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. And you can be seated this morning. Would you pray with me? And pray for me. Dear Lord, we're thankful to be here this morning. God, we're thankful for this church. God, I, there's not another place like it in all the world. And Lord, I thank you for allowing me to be here. I thank you, Lord, for allowing me to pastor such a group of people. God, I thank you, uh, Lord, that you've made it easy on me. And Lord, I pray, God, this morning, Lord, that you would uh, touch us. God, that you'd help us. God, that you'd strengthen us. And Lord, I pray that, Lord, there'd be something said... Uh, Lord, through thy spirit and unction, God, that would motivate and uh, encourage the heart of the listener, Lord, and those that are laboring within our church. Lord, I pray that, God, you'd help us, Lord, uh, for just a little while. Give us liberty, Lord, to preach uh, this message, God, that you've laid upon my heart. God, I pray, Lord, uh, that it will not return void. But I pray that it will accomplish that which you've sent it to do. And Lord, we pray, God, for that one that might be among us, not saved. I pray, Lord, Holy Ghost conviction upon them. Lord, I pray that they'd get saved before it's everlasting too late. Lord, help us, God. In Jesus' name, forgive us where we failed you. And amen. Amen. So Joshua chapter 15, when you come there, you'll find that Joshua has divided and delivered... Uh, the land of Canaan to the children of Israel. You understand that they was the 12 tribes and uh, God had uh, allotted a piece of land there in that promised land uh, uh, to the nation of Israel. And let me just say this, that all of that land still belongs uh, uh, to the Jew. It always has and it always will. Uh, and I believe that uh, here in these verses, Caleb, the eldest of his family, the patriarch of his family, has been given the title deed uh, uh, to the area of Hebron. And we understand that Hebron, it was uh, uh, that mountainous country, that hill country. It was uh, the famous words of Caleb was when he went to Joshua and he said, Give me this mountain. Uh, you find that in the scriptures, C Caleb wanted that hill country. Caleb wanted that mountainous region uh, uh, there around Hebron. And if you go back through the scriptures, there was a lot of great things uh, uh, that God did in this area and in and about this land. Uh, uh, we understand that the area that Caleb was given uh, uh, in that was the city of Jerusalem. So we understand Jerusalem was the Mecca or the central city there throughout all of the Old and the New Testament. It'll be in the city of Jerusalem that, uh, uh, that uh, Jesus will sit upon a throne and reign for a thousand years. You say, preacher, do you really believe that? I, I really believe that. Why? Because that's exactly uh, uh, what the Bible says is going to take place. Uh, uh, the curse of sin will be lifted uh, and Jesus will sit upon David's throne in the city of David and there he will rule uh, and he will reign. But we understand uh, uh, that this is a predominant area or a predominant region in the Bible. Caleb desired a hill country. I believe one of the reasons why Caleb desired this place, you go back and you study it, it was at this place that Caleb and Joshua viewed the land when uh, they, when Moses sent spies into the land, well, Joshua and Caleb, they were young men at this time. They went, and I believe that it might have been this place that Caleb looked around and, and looked over at Joshua and said, Joshua, I reckon we'll be able to take this land. 
Oh, there's giants in this land, uh, and uh, there's a lot of enemies in this land, but I know that with the help of God, uh, we can overcome them. And I believe Joshua and Caleb, as they stood there, Caleb said, and when we do take the land, where we're standing is the area that I want. And then, you know, on their way back out of spying out the land, on their way back out, they got the grapes of Eskel, and it took two men to carry one cluster. Amen. You talk about a blessing, a land that floweth with milk and honey. But then, you know, the story, they got over there, and there was uh, two men had a good report and ten men that didn't. And so we find that in our text, Joshua has divided and delivered the land of Canaan to the children of Israel. Caleb's been given the hill country of Hebron. And so I can imagine in my mind that Caleb takes his family, all of his family, his uh, brothers, his children, all of his family that falls under Caleb went to Hebron. And then when they got over there, Caleb has in his hand the title deed uh, uh, to the area that God had delivered unto him. And when he gets over there, he's got to look at his family and begin to divvy out the suburbs of Hebron. He's going to divvy out the lot that falls to each one of his children and all of his relatives. That's how it worked in those days. And so as Caleb's dividing his lot among his family, he gives Kenaz, his brother, the Negev area. If you study in the scriptures, you'll find that the area that Ken has, and that was Caleb's brother, there's a lot of people this morning, so you're going to have to stay with me. And I mean, we're going to talk about a whole family tree, and it ain't like the ones in East Tennessee. See, in East Tennessee, the family tree's all on one limb. Amen? I'm just kidding. But we understand this morning that Caleb and Ken has their brothers. Ken has comes to Caleb and says, Caleb, where should I take my family. Caleb says, well, we're in Hebron. I'm going to give you the Negev area. So you take, uh, you take your sons and you go down there to the Negev. And if you read, you'll find that the Negev is an arid, dry, and rocky desert south of Hebron. And so uh, we understand from our text that there came a time when Caleb desired a young man because Caleb's he's an old man at this time. He's a seasoned veteran in this thing. He's aged. He, he ain't what he once was. He can't fight like he once did. So he asked for a young man that would stand up in the midst of their family and defeat the enemies that stood before them. And there was a young man by the name of Othniel. And Othniel was Kenaz's son. So Othniel is the nephew of Caleb. And uh, so Othniel stands up and he goes in. He defeats them by uh, enemies. And, and uh, Caleb uh, gives Othniel a daughter to wife. And that was, was Axa. Now I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but... Y'all read it and y'all come up with your own interpretation, but Axka. And so they go down there, Kenaz and his family, they're down there in the Negev area. They're in a dry desert. It's not a good place. The Negev, that south land that Axka is talking about, y'all ever heard of the back 40? That's what this land is like. Out of all the land in Canaan, scholars say that this was probably the most fruitless area in all of Canaan. Wasn't a whole lot going on down there. It was a dry desert. And so we understand that Axka goes to her husband and says, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to talk to Dad and see if he can't give us some springs of water. I want you to understand some things about Axka. There was no lot to be given to the ladies of that day. If you read your Bible, you'll find that the lot of the land 
fell to the men, each one of the men leaders. Now, ladies, I'm not speaking that to your uh, demise this morning. Or I'm not speaking down to you. My wife's a woman. Don't forget that. Amen. Sometimes people say, preacher's being mean to the ladies. No, my wife's a lady. I'm not being mean this morning. I'm just saying that's how God operated, Brother Bill. And so, so Kenaz, he's got his lot. He gives it to his son, says, go down there. We're going to give you this plot of land. And, and uh, Othniel and, 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 and Axka, they're down there. And uh, she's not been given land. Had she not been married, they wouldn't have been nothing to give to her. She'd have been living at daddy's house on daddy's land. But I want you to notice this. She attained an inheritance by the hand of her husband. Now, does that sound familiar to anybody this morning? Does that sound a little bit like the church, the saved, those of us that are born again, we've been given an inheritance by the hand of our husband. Say, who is our husband? Well, we are the bride of who? Christ. We're the bride of Christ this morning. We are uh, his, uh, his, the apple of his eye. Whereas Israel is the apple of God's eye, the church is the apple of Christ's eye. Who is our heavenly father? Well, uh, uh, there was a time when we didn't have a father as, as far as our spirituality is concerned. Uh, uh, but when Jesus came along uh, and uh, we was married to him, God uh, uh, became our father. Uh, uh, so we understand that she not only attained an inheritance by her husband, but she had access to the father by her husband. There was a day, Brother Bill, when you and I couldn't have gone to God. God the Father, uh, but when Jesus came along and married us, uh, it gave us access unto the Father. And so I see a picture of the church. Axka is a good picture of the church. She's been given an inheritance by the hand of her husband, and that inheritance came directly from Caleb. He's the father. He's the patriarch. Her, her father is Caleb. She's been given an inheritance because she's married. And then she has access by the father. Now, I want you to notice, it's her father. But in order to get to her father, she had to move her husband. Ain't that interesting? I mean, that's her daddy. But in order to get him to do anything, she had to first move her husband. You know what we what what do we do? We we pray in Jesus name. And so every petition that goes up, every need that we have, every prayer that we pray, when we pray, we are we're asking Jesus, we're asking our spiritual, our heavenly husband, uh, that we might move him uh, uh, to look over at his father, our father, uh, uh, that he might uh, get an answer. So what God does, he turns back over to his son and says, son, is that one of yours? Yeah, that's my wife and she's in need of something. Amen. Amen. And so we find that in order for her to obtain what she's looking for, she had to move her husband. And when she moved her husband, she got the ear of her father. Amen. See, now, we, now we're seeing the direct path. Because I believe they sometimes when you move God, when you move Christ, when you move the Son, when you move the spiritual husband, God will look over and say, step back, let me see what their need is. Amen. And so we find here a good picture of the church. I want to preach to Solway this morning on this thought about the Southland. We've talked a lot about, in days gone by recently, about sowing seed, about planting seed, seeing the seed to prosper, seeing the harvest come to pass, seeing that the harvest in, in the Gospels is white, it's ripe, it's ready for the picking. 
the laborers are few. We talked about the, the sower of the seed as he went into his field. There was different areas there where he sowed seed and some prospered and some failed. But as I look at this, I'm looking this morning and I'm interested in the south land. This land that Axka has been given that she has inherited by the hand of her father is a dry, arid land. And I believe that uh, there'll be times when we'll look around and say, man, the lot that's befell us is dry and it's arid and it's nothing more than a desert. Now, I don't know about you, but there has been times when I've come to church and I thought, man, we're, we're operating in a desert. There's been times when I've come to church and I thought, man, it's dry in here. There's been times that I've come and I've thought, man, the atmosphere uh, that we're trying to worship in is arid. Uh, it's not conducive to produce fruit. It's not conducive to plant seed. And it's not conducive to see uh, the growth. And, and, and there's been times, Brother Ron, when I've thought to myself, we're trying to have church in the Southland. See, there's a lot of different ways we could preach this this morning, but this is the way that the Lord has laid on my heart. Axka done some things with her south land. Can I say that there's, there, there's an opportunity for this south land to be more than what it is currently. And she knew that because she remained optimistic. See, in order for us to ever grasp hold of the opportunities that lie before us as a church, we must always remain optimistic. 